United Public Radio Network from 9 to 10 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 to 1 a.m. Eastern Time with your spiritual warrior goddess, Kathy Bilski. Kathy will share all the old truths the Illuminati tries to keep secret. Kathy also gives you the opportunity to join in with planetary healing light work that will help us manifest World Enlightenment 2016. So let's get high and fly into new possibilities. So join Kathy every Friday night on UPRN, the Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show. A very powerful happening. Hello, this is Angela Thomas with a message about living life to the fullest. As a psychic clairvoyant, I often give insights to one's career path, financial situation, or relationship. Whether one is happy or not in their current situation, where he or she is right now is an important part of learning valuable lessons that can lead to fulfilling one's life purpose. If I can offer you insights, feel free to contact me at 636-278-2272. Again, 636-278-2272, or visit my website, AngelaThomas.org. I'm considered a psychic psychic, so I provide accurate and detailed psychic readings for individuals as well as groups. Remember, no matter what influences your life at the moment, live life to the fullest. Stay in gratitude, count your blessings, and prepare yourself for more opportunities around the corner. I'm Psychic Angela Thomas, and my website is AngelaThomas.org. The UPRN family of shows would like to take a moment to thank our loyal listeners for tuning in to UPRNTalkRadio.com along with 107.7 FM New Orleans. Broadcasting on multiple platforms like Live 365, Ustream, and Shoutcast has made the UPRN the longest-running, highly-rated, and best source of quality, unique programming that is not afraid of the status quo in alternative media. This station has a solid course of shows and hosts that refuse to get stuck in a rut or be overrun by a groupthink mentality because station owner, host, and iCar founder Joe Montaldo knows the value of letting his talented stable of hosts grow uninhibited. In this genre, that's an accomplishment which many in alternative radio are striving for but are left consistently wanting. This is all made possible because of you, the listener, that tunes in live every night who can tell the difference that independent thinking makes. The best way to show our appreciation is to thank you and continue to allow our listeners the ability to download the archives of all the shows free of charge on iTunes, Podbean, and SoundCloud. No monthly fees, no cost to download individual shows, and none of the constant hassling for donations. That's the UPRNRadio.com difference. So stick around. There's much more to come with new shows on the way. For now, feel free to join your favorite show live in the Pal Talk chat room. Easily accessible off UPRNTalkRadio.com. And share the experience of listening live with... <laughs>
Church of Mabel. Oh, I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I'm ready. Right. <laughs> Welcome to the Church of Mabus Radio Show. It's Friday night. You're listening to United Public Radio 107.7 FM New Orleans. A couple of things to plug real quick. The Dream Quest of the Lit Bow. <laughs> Make sure I said that right. The Dream Quest of Valette Bow. That's B E L L I T T B O E by K- by Kiz Johnson. It's from Tor Books. It must be like some weird Lovecraft fantasy kind of thing going on in here. But it's a fantasy book. Looks pretty good. Uh, the Warren by Brian Evanson. A creepy, mind bending quest of identity and mystery told with a master skill. No one explores inner landscapes quite like Brian Evanson. Uh, the Warren by Brian Evanson. The Tor books, they have great titles. So check out Tor. Uh, what else? Uh, the 26th Annual February uh, 2017 uh, International UFO Congress, uh, February 15th through the 19th. That's ufocongress.com. Uh, check that out. Let me see if I got everything. Oh, next Friday is uh, Nick Redfern. Uh, We're going to be talking about monsters and water monsters. And our final show, see, Nick Redfern was going to do the uh, 28th, but I had to switch him because he had to change it. And I wanted him to be still part of the Halloween lineup. But some friends of mine, new friends of mine, Jeffrey Shanks and Mark Finn are going to come on the show, and they put out Skelos, S-K-E-L-O-S, the Journal of Weird Fiction and Dark Fantasy. And we're going to talk about uh, H.P. Lovecraft and also Robert Howard, the guy that wrote Conan, the Barbarian. So there's a bunch of weird stuff in the magazine. It's like a fantasy horror magazine. Um, And I've always loved Conan and Robert Howard. There's a good movie I just got that I saw a long time ago called the Whole Wide World with Vincent D'Onofrio and Renee Zellweger, and it's the story of Robert Howard. And he was a weird dude, but that movie's pretty good. It's called The Whole Wide World. I just got that cheap off eBay. I need to watch it. It's been a while. But uh, he's running around doing, like, Conan skits everywhere, and him and Renee Zellweger are fighting. <laughs> it's like back in the, God, what? I don't even know. What, 30s or does it say on the box? I mean, it's back in the day. I don't know the exact time period, but it's definitely back in the day. Uh, probably 30s, yeah, during Lovecraft and all that. So definitely look forward to that. We got Jay with us here tonight. Good evening. Good evening. And we Good also evening. have Ronnie Thomas. He's here for No Place for the Living, the I mad story it. of Carl von Kossel. Let me see how you how you doing, Ron? Very good, very good. Everything's good up here in Brooklyn. <laughs> Definitely. So this story took place in 1930, and I was shocked to see that it happened in Florida. Like this is is this where the the madness all started in Florida, where we all all the crazy yeah. stories. This is like the the origin point, maybe. <laughs> you're, you're you're so close to the Bermuda Triangle. You know, it's like there's got to be something about that. There really does. Because there's so much weird stuff down in Florida, man. But, yes, it, it, I, I'd say, not to go too intellectual, but I'd say it started in Germany when uh, Carl von Kassel was born. Because <laughs> I think he was born weird as so many of us are. <laughs> yeah, definitely. And basically, uh, it started, he came here. Why did he come to America? Well, you know, his accounts is what I base my research on. I kind of take a 14 approach to it. But his sister had moved here. His mother was dying, and she said, hey, you know, go go find yourself a better life in America, as so many people at that time did. Um, And he claimed to have all this kind of scientific knowledge, five degrees. He could speak eight languages. God knows what they were. Um, But he landed in, you know, Zephyr Hills, Florida. He, he he didn't quite land in Key West first. So Zephyr Hills, which is, I, I think, where your reservoir is, um, is, is his first time in Florida there. <laughs> well, let me get this to the, the listeners. Basically, uh, I'm just going to read an excerpt from the Rue Morgue uh, 
uh, page. Uh, Von Kossel's uh, obsession did not subside. Believing himself to be acting on instruction from the dead woman's spirit, Von Kossel removed the corpse from the mausoleum in which it was interred, carried it to his Key West home in a toy wagon, and spent the next seven years trying to preserve and resurrect it. And this was his, was this his dead wife? No. Okay, so I'll back up a tiny bit, and I'll fill in some of those blanks. And there are so many blanks to fill in uh, with this story, you know. One of the things that fascinates me about these stories is who knows what the truth is. I'm always attracted to untold truths, like who, who, who can actually tell. But when he was a young academic, as he says, he'd been introduced to the spirit of this woman that he would eventually find in Key West, Florida. Um, and he was working in his German laboratory, as you can imagine, the theremin music playing, and he's down there, uh, you know, kind of carving away at one thing or another, core science, as he'd call it. You know, he was, he was, he was into uh, materialism. He's what we, you, nowadays we'd call a materialist. There is nothing other than what's in the natural world. And all of a sudden the room for him, started shifting and shaping and uh, challenging his perception of the material world. And his ancestor, this countess that he says had been haunting his old home, appears to him. And she says, uh, I've, I've been trying to get your attention. You haven't, you haven't uh, signed on to it. <laughs> so I had to break your equipment. Uh, and she smashes a lot of his stuff, and it's like a malignant, like a poltergeist, basically. Um, and then he describes as hiding behind this woman who it was he thought to be his ancestor was a <laughs> Cuban woman, or at the time he said Spanish woman, who peeks her head out very coquettishly, and <laughs> says, "Hey, you know, like uh, eventually I'll be your bride." And he sees her face and he becomes obsessed with this notion that there's somebody waiting for him, that he can't quite figure out this mystery. Uh, and he says in his journal that that became the mission of his life, you know, that, that, that became his obsession was to find this woman. He did get married to a flesh and bone wife <laughs> in between all this. Uh, but when he journeyed to Florida is when he, he met the woman who would become the corpse, who would become his wife, who would become his obsession. <laughs> so i got to ask, does this guy have any Nazi ties? Because that was my first thought. They've got a Nazi over here, buddy. <laughs> no, he, he was World War One. He came to America after World War War One. so... Yeah, so he, well, he he goes. Um, well, no, he came in in the '30s. So this was like Weimar era that he came to the states. So he managed. The one thing he did right was, you know, avoid <laughs> not the Nazi regime because <laughs> they would not have liked him very much because he's an oddball. <laughs> Uh, well, they but put him to work. <laughs> nah, he, he wouldn't have liked that very much. Trust me, he would have been very upset with having to have done real work. Because um, I, I think he's kind of an artsy guy. Um, but no, he, he escapes that, and he, he has a lot to say about uh, the first strike. Or not, not the first strike. The um, got the the first world war and 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 the destruction and how Germany had gone from being this industrious place to a laughing stock and would eventually become even worse. So yeah, I like think it was are. a good thing. Yeah, right. <laughs> like we are right now. <laughs> yeah. We're on the verge, I think, of uh, something going on for sure. Yeah, I'm sure. But, you know, <laughs> but, it, but, but in his time, it, you know, as our grandparents would tell you, you just come, you came and went. So he decided to come to America, uh, which at the time seemed like the right place to be, it's the land of opportunity, uh, for especially for a guy like this. He, look, Carl von Kassel was uh, what we describe today as a loser, um, but I don't think he was. I, I think he had a lot to say. I think he was a better artist than he was a scientist. Um, but 
you know, he meets this woman and decides that this was the person I wanted to be with my whole life and leaves behind, you know, a legacy of sorrow. <laughs> So what was he? What was he career-wise? Was he a doctor? Or what was he? He says he had a lot of different degrees, um, but the one thing that everyone can substantiate was that he knew how to work the X-ray machine. That was a new technology at the time. So I'm always fascinated by that. Like in all my research about this guy, what like? how did this German immigrant know how to work an x-ray machine? He was either like an autodidact, somebody who can just figure things out, or, you know, just really was a comedy of errors. <laughs> like, but he did know how to work the x-ray machine. So they put him to work in the marine, maritime hospital because nobody else knew how to do it. So I guess he was a scientist, you know, I mean... Maybe he was just intuitive. <laughs> so he met the woman. How did that happen? So the woman who would go on to be his obsession and then go on to be the corpse and then go on to be his bride, uh, yeah. she had <laughs> she had um, tuberculosis, which at the time was, as you know, incurable. And... And he, uh, what, do, what would you say, like, uh, given her by the fates, you know, he he became obsessed with saving her life. And in his kind of Ed Wood mind, thought he could actually do this. And, you know, as I think we're all kind of Charles Fort people here. We, we, we dispel disbelief. Maybe he could have, you know, maybe he had something and... Um, but it just didn't work, you know. <laughs> like he he he, re he he resigned himself to save her life, and shot her with so much radiation. God knows what he was doing to her, you know. Even worse than the tuberculosis, <laughs> um, and, it, and maybe it might have cured it. I mean, maybe he was trying to evaporate it, radiate it. Uh, but he 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 really did think he could save this girl's life, and you know, I think that the romantic part of that is overlooked nowadays. It wasn't overlooked at the time, but it's, it's overlooked nowadays uh, that I think he did. His, his, his motivations were pure. He thought that he could save her, you know, but he didn't. She died. <laughs> and thus is that when the madness hit, I would, I would assume. I, I, I think the madness hit well before she died. I think that, um, you know, I think he was delusional, as so many of us are, you know, I mean, who who doesn't want to escape reality all the time, you know? But I and I but I think his delusions weighed up, you know, they they went further than we'd think they'd go. And he paid for this lavish funeral for this woman, you know? And he didn't have much money. I mean, even though he'd said he was some kind of count, this guy was he was a poor guy. But he he was really committed to what he was doing for this corpse. Uh, and when he put her into the ground, he was really disturbed. You know, think of like biting your nails and take that to the next degree and then the next degree and the next degree. He was obsessed with keeping this woman alive. Um, as much as he doesn't believe in the physical nature of spirit, I think he couldn't get away from the materialist part of that, you know. He had to keep her around. So they bury her in the ground, uh, and the family are, you know, just kind of obviously distraught. But then they dig her up. He he asked them to dig her up because, and this isn't to take him take her home with him. They say, you know, he he asked, hey, can you dig the body up because. I'm afraid she's going to get damaged by the moisture because down where you are, of course, the water level is uh, is higher. So the moisture is going to just corrode her body. And this very opportunistic funeral home owner <laughs> is like, well, yeah, fine, we'll dig her up. No big deal. We'll, you know, just sign a check and we'll do it. And you, And 
he oversees her reinterment, which means he can do whatever he wants with her. So she has two funerals. <laughs> you know, wow. the one when she acts. Yeah, yeah. It's it's it, it, and it sounds gross, but you always have to try and put yourself in this person's you know point of view. Yeah, I, I have reflections of thinking about, you know, Norman Bates and stuff with this guy a lot. Like, I was into the Bates show and Robert Bloch and all that stuff, was, you know, the books and everything and the movies. I, and I'm definitely re- recalling that in my mind. And plus it makes it even more creepier that it happened here in Florida. It's a little too close, a little too close to home. <laughs> Which, so it's, it's a great story for Halloween. There's no doubt about that. It's perfect. It It's definitely a creepy story. And it and it and it is. I mean, like the guy lived with the, the the remains of a human body for seven years. I mean, seven years is a long time to spend with anybody. <laughs> you know. And yet he's he's there with this inanimate thing, but he but he sees these visions of her, you know, and talk about creepy. Like he oh, sees time. her Necromancy yeah. thing going on, right? Well, yeah. I mean, like it. She's actually coming back to life, at least in his mind, right? So, who are we to say that she's not actually? And he claims in his journal that she did come back to life at several points. Now, can you imagine sitting? Now, we all have our lonely moments in our rooms, but can you imagine sitting in a dark room? And this thing that you've tried to reconstruct, so it's basically a wax puppet, sits up in bed and turns its head kind of creakingly towards you. And all you feel is love. I'd tell you, and this is me exposing myself, I would run for the hills. (laughs) (laughs) But he he embraced it. And 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 I believe he saw what he saw. I don't think it was a healthy sight, but, you know, and none of us would ever want to see that. <laughs> Definitely. I'm reading that uh, you were you were planning to, to make my dog won't shut up. I want to go grab him in a minute. But I, about your uh, the Kickstarter page and the DVD and everything, and I didn't know that you were going to have this Richard Stanley guy. I've seen hardware. And one of the questions I just noticed, the other world, what was that? I've never seen that. The other, it's one of his movies or something. The other world. Uh, it's uh, one of his one of his docs. He he's a good friend. He's a friend. Um, we I, I met Richard in, in Mexico. I'd always, I'd always loved uh, Hardware and, and uh, Dust Devil, which is another great one that you should check out. And beyond that, I think the doc they did about uh, Stanley speaks volumes about his, you know, kind of his, the, the way that he acts, but. Other worlds is, you know, I don't, you know, no, I can't speak to it. It's not my film, but um, it's 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 our lives. It's where we are. You know, we're so we're, we're so looking to escape where we are right now, and I think that's why Elon Musk is putting us on Mars. <laughs> <laughs> so you were gonna do puppets? I was. I mean, well, you know what? I I'm almost embarrassed by the whole. Kickstarter thing because I was led down a road that I I didn't really want to go down. I wanted to make this thing more of a Hollywood film. And I hate to say that because I'm not a Hollywood guy and I don't want to ever be a Hollywood guy. But I did want to make, I want to do my guy, Von Kossel. I want to do him justice. And I think the only way to communicate with people is to go for the lowest common denominator. And the producers I'm working with right now, and I should say that it's no longer a documentary. I'm, I've written a script. It's 107 pages, which is exhausting for most people. Um, but the, pe- the right people liked it. And it's with some very influential producers right now who liken it to Ed Wood, the, the Tim Burton film, which is complimentary because it was the last good film that Tim Burton made. <laughs> no, actually, that's not true. Mars Attacks was great. But um, I... I knew that the documentary wasn't right, you know, like I, there's not, it's not an interesting documentary. You can't see anything. There's no drama. The drama was back then. I should say that the most interesting thing about 
his story, Don Castle's story, is that the people of Key West <laughs> loved him. I mean, he was a hero. They celebrated him. I mean, these people really, really thought, like, highly of this guy. He wasn't, like, at, the, at that time, in that place, he wasn't seen as gross. And he wasn't seen as scary. And wh- what does that mean to you? You know, like, what do you think that means? Like, why, why might these, these people be on his side? I don't know. That's weird. They were celebrating this guy after they knew he did this stuff? Well, but I think what they saw was more where we are today. Romance is dead, right? Rom- like, and romance in the truest sense of the word, whereas life meeting death, right? So if, if those two worlds collide, then what happens, you know? And that, that is by and large where we are nowadays. Life is meeting death. We're at the beginning and the end of everything. And that's the purest distillation of, of human life, of the human condition. And I think that in that time, it was right before the Second World War, you know, the New Deal had come in, all these great political movements had come in to make America great again, <laughs> ironically. Oh and they God. actually did at that point. But, yeah. you know, you also had this guy who was doing his own thing and the minutia of doing your own thing, you know, like I don't have to answer to anybody. You know, I could just be here tucked away in Key West. And at the time, Key West was kind of an artist community, right? So yeah. the, the artist could, the same as New York had once been, and I can go on and on about New York and what it has become and what it had once been. But, you know, we can't lament that. He, here was a guy who didn't care about any of that. He did his own thing. And he took this woman from her grave and, you know, slept with her, not sexually explicitly, but, you know, slept in the bed with her for a long period of time, you know. And who were we to judge? (laughs) Man. Is that wrong to say? (laughs) It's definitely a trip out for sure. The the Florida residents celebrating this. That's that's hard to <laughs> hard to swallow. But hey, they didn't have much other things to do. No T V shows, right? No no nothing. <laughs> Your story. They have a party. <laughs> I Jeff, I, I, I think they were right too. And I'm not saying that to be shocking. I, I think they needed that romance, you know. So what kind of experiments did he do on the body? I mean, is there any detail about that? I Lots of radiation. Lots of shooting her body with... And if you put yourself back in time, of course, you're, you're, that's a new technology. We can see through bodies, x-ray. Well, then it must have some kind of rejuvenating thing. The same as we see stem cells nowadays, you know. I think that that was the newest, that was the edgy technology back then. Of course, uh, the man with with x-ray eyes, I mean, like, you have to think about, like, this is something that shouldn't be, but is, but and is scientifically proven. That's what we're always fighting, right? We have to prove it. But I don't think he could. Definitely something in... And he was seeing her apparition during this whole body situation. Did he go into any detail what she was saying to him or anything? She was goading him on to do the body and stuff? or? Oh, well, that was her... It, the whole thing was her idea. <laughs> she she was the one. So, are we, are we on yet? Because this is a good one for the uh, for the audience there. Yeah, we're, we're on, we're on, we're the, on. Um, the... <laughs> He puts a telephone in her, and this is all allegedly, but who cares? He puts a telephone in the mausoleum that he buys, uh, that he builds by hand. (laughs) And he picks up the phone and touches the receiver, and apparently he can talk to her body. He's been talking to her in the tomb. Now he can talk to her spirit through the telephones, which is, again, a new technology. So she concocts the idea to kidnap her body from the cemetery. 
she wants to be with him and tell him she wanted to be with him. Uh, but now she could, she could um, you know, do all that through this telephone that he's crudely wired through the uh, graveyard. <laughs> Everything was crude with him and nothing ever worked. His airplane had no wings. You know, his inventions never had any chance of working, but, you know, we believe in him. <laughs> well, I like it. I, I'm into Frankenstein a lot. Like, I, any movie, I, I, I collect them and buy them, you know, from the Roger Corman to anything. Sure. And uh, uh, there's the dance, uh, the guy that did Dark Shadows did a Frankenstein. I, I have that. Like, any way I can get a hold of Frankenstein, that's what appeals to me about this, too, a lot. There's, I'm into the universal uh horror monsters like Dracula and Frankenstein and all that. So Frankenstein, he's got some Frankenstein going on, ain't no doubt about it. I I definitely think he's kind of a real-life Frankenstein. But rather than taking body parts from other corpses, he chooses to reconstruct her. So I think it's more Lovecraft's reanimator, where he's just trying to reconstruct this figure. And if you look at the pictures, and I hope you'll... If anyone uh, you know has uh, access to the the Kickstarter page, I, I do put pictures of her before and after, and they look nothing alike. But in his mind, he reconstructed this wax body, you know, like, and it's creepier than anything that you'll see this Halloween. Believe me, her face. For, forget the clowns, man. It's you know, it's all about. Elena's face as he re envisioned it. Yeah, I'm looking at okay, yeah. I, I skimmed it one time but now I'm going back to look. You're gonna have nightmares, don't do it. I mean it's horrifying. There's d- just dead eyes and the the just the the waxy appeal of her face. That that's the first thing that attracted me to the story is what her face wound up looking like and trying to communicate with this thing that had once been and was no longer. <laughs> God, yeah, the after reminds me of Leatherface or something, that face. <laughs> oh. oh, Leatherface is... I'd have dinner with Leatherface. I wouldn't have dinner... I would not have dinner with Elena. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, you're going to try to stick with the puppet situation? No, no, no. I, 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 I think... To me, this needs to be interpreted in like a Tim Burton fashion and or, or a David Lynch fashion. And the yeah. script I wrote about the film, which I do stand by, and that was originally what I wanted to do. I never wanted to do a documentary, but I only am known for documentary films. So I thought, all right, well, I'll I'll try and adapt this for documentary, and it never quite worked, you know. It never made any sense, and then I and then when the Kickstarter failed, which, you know, it, you know, I don't, I'm not, I wasn't happy about it, but it was kind of relieved because I just wrote this script, and I wrote this, you know, thing that I thought would be, this is the movie I want to make. Like if I have to make movies, which seems to be what I'm on on, on the search for, this is the movie I want to make, and there's a lot of wacky surreal very scary moments in there and there's a lot of very funny moments because I think, do you know uh, Grand Guignol, the French kind of uh, playhouse? No. <laughs> it's They played with like hot and cold. Like, okay. I've always wanted to make a film that would be equal parts scary and funny but in the purest distillation of those two. So Those are always the best. I'm big into horror and I like it when you know they mix horror and comedy in the right way like with Evil Dead and stuff like that absolutely so, yeah. He, yeah he played with you in that film and that's I don't think he knew he was doing that but I think that like when you're a child and when you're coming up it's everything is fear and comedy fear and comedy that's the only way you can relate to the world right so I want to make this film as messed up as possible and I want to make you laugh and then quickly terrify you and make you laugh again and then quickly terrify you again because I think that playing with those boundaries, those are the only two... Look at what what are the two film genres that work? Comedy and horror. Definitely. You know, 
Does drama, does anyone really, do you remember the last indie drama you saw? Nobody gives a damn, you know? I don't it's know. all drama. <laughs> drama. Our lives are drama, man. <laughs> Need escape. That's the, that's the point, you know? The, the way the world is right now, the more escapes, the better. I'm thinking of Frank and Weenie right now. You have to, you know, you have to think about the grief of losing someone. I've lost my father, lost my stepfather, and I, the, the, those times with such grief, it changed my life on some many, many, many levels. And uh, like, you, and I have a dog I'm with now that's a Jack Russell Terrier mix named Jack, and he has seizures. And I know one day he's going to croak, and I'm probably going to go crazy like Frank and Weenie or this guy or something. But uh, <laughs> but I can understand what the the grief of losing someone. Could, I could understand how I could do this. I mean, it's hard to fathom how it. You know, to this extreme, but I, I understand on a psychological level what it feels like. I mean, all of us do, I'm sure, on some level of losing someone. It can do a number on you, you know. I see. It's so weird, you know, and, you know, bringing up Frankenweenie is such a perfect example because Frankenstein wasn't the loss of somebody. Frankenweenie, as Tim Burton did, as silly as it sounds, was very smart. Death isn't the problem, loss is the problem. And as we, if I have to go back to Cosell, Cossel, Cosell, Howard Cosell, Von Cossel, if I have to go back to his story, it was the loss that was so painful. Death is easy. Loss is difficult. And I think that that's where we land with this story. You know, how do you deal with loss? And what, what, is that, what does that make you in the end? And in his case, You'd say it made him a madman. You'd say it made him a mad scientist. And I do think he was the quintessential mad scientist. Here's a guy who, forget your Frankensteins and anything, he actually did it. I mean, he really ponied up and did it. I mean, that was, in my eyes, he's the only mad scientist that ever lived. Not that I haven't covered others, but... (laughs) Yeah, I had an incident once on a forum that I ran a long, long, long time ago and uh, there's this guy I knew, and he was great. He posted all the time. He he was a moderator, and he was like the perfect moderator. Well, one time he vanished. I was like, well, where'd he go? I only knew him like by his, well, I knew him by both names, but uh, his screen name and then his real name, but mostly I just called him by his, his uh, screen name, which was regular Schmo. Well, anyway, one day I put a... Uh, his name in you know Google, and I pulled him up in the news, and, and where he was in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and there was this crazy story about his mother died, and he kept her in the bed dead, and kept collecting her check, and didn't tell nobody. And I was like, that's 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 pretty well, not exactly. I mean, it's different than this, but still on some levels, it's kind of the same with the weird keeping the dead body situation, the Norman Bates situation. But it just the thought of that this. This guy keeping his dead mother in her bed and just dealing with it every day, man. See, but see, but he, but he had something to gain from that. You know, our boy Von Kossel had nothing to gain. He had everything to lose. I don't think his motivations were as skewed as your as what you were just saying. I feel like, you know, to, to do well, exactly. Look, like if, but Norman Bates would. Would, would keep his mother, you know, I love my mom. I'm an Italian boy from Brooklyn, New York. I love my mother. And when she goes, I'm going to be sad. I'm going to put her to bed and say goodnight. But I think for, in this situation, it was a different kind of love because there was a bit of sexuality there. And it's a lot more confusing. You know, I don't think that there was any gain for him. He wasn't trying to get anything. He wasn't doing it to... You know, I mean, we're, it, we're, in America, we're so perverted by the idea of political, financial, or, you know, some kind of gain. Some people don't care about that. And I think Von Kossel didn't really care. And that's why he's such a great character. He didn't, he, was, he, wasn't, he wasn't motivated by what a lot of us see as the end goal. There was no money. There, all he wanted to do was live in, in my mind, the fantasy world where a lot of us want to live. Because who says, who's to say that's not the real world, you know? 
when we go to sleep, you know? I mean, maybe, maybe that's the real world and this is the this is the dream, right? <laughs> Jay, are you here? I'm here. <laughs> I don't see I don't see you in the chat. That's why I was asking. I mean, I'm just Yeah, no, I I, I turned the computer. I have the computer off because I've like been up before. So if I watch the computer, I'll zonk out. <laughs> and I was like, "Did you drop?" Okay, well we're gonna turn over the J for a little bit, and then uh, what we're gonna do, Ronnie? How long do you got? The show's two hours. Are you okay with that? Or you need less? There's an eight minute no. break coming up. Yeah, I'll, I'm sticking around, man. Okay, so you're good for the whole show. Absolutely. All right, nice. All right, we're going to turn over to Jay, and then we'll take a break, and then I'll lead in on the second hour. Go ahead, Jay. All right, so I find this absolutely fascinating. I'm surprised I hadn't heard about this previously, but uh, it definitely speaks Frankenstein, like Jeff said. But I want to go back a little bit earlier in his life. I I think I've seen where he went south, (laughs) because he literally, uh, sometime after he got married, he had his two daughters in Germany, uh, and then he goes through India to Australia for some reason, and it don't, I wasn't able to find the reason, uh, but he pauses in Australia to collect equipment and boats, and he buys a house, and he buys an island, and he's wanting to go towards the South Seas, and then the war breaks out, and they arrest him for being a national German citizen and uh, put him in an internment camp. So can you talk about that? Is, it, is that where you think he went? Bonkers, because the the guy sounds like a nice guy, but he also sounds absolutely bat guano crazy. <laughs> he definitely is bat guano crazy, as you say. But that's where he builds the in Australia is where he builds the pipe organ, which has a big part in uh, the script I've written and the film. So he builds this pipe organ out of fragments of, you know, and he claims, but it, he definitely didn't, but. He claims he built this pipe organ out of the Australian beach remnants of whatever. And he takes the pipe organ everywhere with him. So we travel with guitars nowadays. He travels with the pipe organ. (laughs) I don't know that that's where he went nuts. I mean, maybe that's where you would go nuts because you're tested to your limits. But that's how we see it nowadays. Back then, look, I didn't have heat and hot water for six days here in New York. And I was ready to, like, kill everybody. I was going Lord of the Flies. <laughs> but, yeah, but when he was in an internment camp and, and wrote sort of a, um, a a journal or a you know, an autobiography type of thing that was eventually published in some magazine, so maybe it's the internment that, you know, he got his weird ideas. But he also seemed to get, uh, while he was down there, interested in uh, electro- electron engineering and electrical type of work. So maybe he also, that's where he gains his, technological knowledge of operating an x-ray machine uh, and that kind of thing. But it just, it seems to me that that's, that's where everything starts to go south for him. Is, I mean, being, a, being arrested for a, not a military person and being interred with, uh, I think he was interred with uh, Chinese and Indian uh, war criminals uh, or uh, prisoners of war, uh, that's the kind of thing that a normal person would absolutely get PTSD from, uh, and lose their complete sanity. I, I think the the article you, that you're talking about is the Rosicrucian one where he built the pipe organ, but I don't mm-hmm. know that like I don't know that it had that much of an effect on him. I think that he, I think people like, and maybe I'm projecting. Who knows? But I think that people like like him can escape their immediate reality. And I think that's what he did for so long. I think that he just, even in this kind of world, in, in this internment camp, if you read the, the article he wrote, or the, the, the thing, it was very positive. There's nothing negative about, you know, the only negative thing he ever said was about uh, his, Elena's family, you know, that, that was because they were preventing him from doing what he wanted. Uh, but I, I don't think, I don't, Maybe you're right, and I'm sure that you know there's there, there's room for that. But I don't know that that had so much of an impact. I think it, he saw it as adventure, and he saw it as kind of this. You know, I lived through 9/11 here, and when I look back, as horrible as it sounds, it was exciting, and not in a good way, but in a bad way. And I think that that is how he was seeing what he was going through at that point. But that's open to interpretation 
And I mm -hmm. am, you know, who knows? You know, the human mind is a very strange place to live. <laughs> yeah, it absolutely is. And it sounds like his is one of the more stranger ones. Uh, so, but after that adventure, he he goes back to Germany to find his mom, mm -hmm. uh, and stays with her for three or four years. And the chaos of Germany is just too much for him for one thing. And then she tells him that she's terminal or whatever, which was happening with her, and says to go find your sister. So he leaves. I don't know. Did he, did he have his wife and children with him in Australia? I don't think they said that. But he, he's been away from his wife and children for this, these many years as well. And then yeah. leaves them again to go to Florida, <laughs> and and this is where uh, he gets the job at the with the Marine Marine Corps uh, Hospital in Key West. Sure, or you're going Hill. off. You're you're going off Tom Schweitzer's book, the the von Kossel, the the book that Tom Schweitzer wrote. His right. Account, yeah, and he, oh, yeah. Mentioned in the article that I was looking at. Yeah. So, you know. Well, no, they were not. His family were in Germany at the time. They never went around with him. Uh, it, his existence is so confusing because of the lies and the truths. Like, and when mm -hmm. you mix those two things together, and I hate to sound so philosophical and so dismissive and almost, you know, kind of trying to worm my way out of it, but in a narrative sense, but who knows? What was actually? Good. I don't even know, and there's no evidence to back up that he was ever really in Australia. And if you read yeah. uh, Ben Harrison's book on him, who knows? Like maybe he wasn't even there. You know, maybe he never even went to Australia. Maybe he was only ever in Germany. <laughs> yeah, because it seems like you said earlier he was a, a better artist than of a scientist, and yeah. so maybe he's kind of be a you know he's. When he's in Florida, he gets this job at, at the hospital uh, and then meets Elena. Uh, and we, they, we haven't really talked about her much. Uh, she's kind of got a tragic history, too. Uh, yeah. She's married to a Cuban uh, immigrant, uh, and they have a, they're were about to have a child, and she has a miscarriage, and he leaves her. He doesn't divorce her. He just <laughs> skips town and leaves her alone, and then the tuber tuberculosis comes in, and then that's where they meet. So... Uh, the the thing that, that struck me is that uh, they both have sort of a tragic background, but none of them seem to be psychic. And then she dies of the tuberculosis, or maybe of the X-ray radiation. Um, the, most of the articles say she died of the tuberculosis. But he sits in front of her mausoleum for two years while he sees her visions or her apparition and then serenades her with some Spanish song that he's playing on guitar or organ that, whatever he's, instrument he's carrying with him everywhere. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, and that, I think, is odd. Is it just all of a sudden he becomes psychic? How do, did you find anything about, was he like this before? Was he able to have visions? Was he sort of a medium? In, if you read his journal, and I think in the book you're referencing, the Ben Harrison book, Undying, uh, Undying Love, he goes into the early days of von Kossel's premonitions, you know. And I, and I talked about it earlier, about how he'd been introduced to Elena by his ancestor, you know, like the, this, this Countess Elena. Um, mm -hmm. It's so easy. I, recently I went up to Lilydale, which I'm sure your audience will know, uh, which is a psychic community, uh, near, like Casa Dega down in Florida. And I thought a lot about Von Kossel up there because it's, you have to suspend, suspend disbelief. You cannot, I don't know. You, you, you just have to understand that you know nothing or that you don't know everything. And I think, I don't know. I think that's what he was working towards, you know, in, in his relationship with Elena. Yeah, I mean, it, it definitely sounds like a tragic true love story. And uh, so what he does with her after he disinters her the, the final time and takes her home, uh, and that's where the artistry comes in, where his artist artistic skills come in. Even though the face, at least, and I saw the picture of the, the, the death mask of her that he created with, with silk and wax and makeup and what have you, uh, 
he wasn't just trying to preserve the body. He he literally actually trying to revive her, and we I don't think he actually talked about how did he in his journals or anything that he researched how what was his method what was he, what did he think would be a good way to revive her to life it, resurrect her bring her back to life not Frankensteiner but you know not create a new creature but bring that same soul back to life so <laughs> this is where i have to go back to his airplane and it's going to sound kind of silly but like he'd been trying to build this airplane and um as all things in this guy's life it was half baked it had no it it, it all the workings of an airplane but it didn't have wings <laughs> and I think that's so symbolic of what he was trying to do to resurrect Elena and the way that he tried to do it. But also, we're, you know, criticizing this guy, you know, almost 60 years later. So maybe he was, like, think of yourself when you're a child and you're figuring things out. If you think of, you know, him as this industrious person person trying to figure out what to do in desperation to bring this lady back to life. He's shooting her with uh, radiation. He's putting her in an incubator. He's filling this tub uh, and submerging her corpse in there to regenerate cells. It's, it's what science had once been. I'm not saying that modern scientists aren't, you know, leaps and bounds above what he is but it's the core of what science was. It was experimenting and playing. And I think there's a playfulness to what he was doing. I think that he was playing with her dead body to see if he could actually resurrect her. And I genuinely do. I think if you read his journals, I I don't think there's any uh, malice in there. There's no ego in there. He's just trying to do this one crazy thing. So some of the things he was doing, you know, I wouldn't, I have a beautiful wife. I think she's wonderful. I, if she died, you know, I'd put her in the ground or, you know, I'd, I'd let it, I'd let the physical body be as much as he believed in the spirit. I don't, I think he was a materialist. I think he wanted to bring, to keep her physically around because he never had a chance to lay down with her physically. Yeah, it sounds like it goes back to his trying to escape reality uh, with with her, with what he's doing with with her corpse, uh, and and they were both married at the time that they were sort of having their non love affair. Uh, but with the experimentation, you know, if you talk to many doctors today, uh, they'll tell you quite quite frankly that they are closer to a cure for death than they are to a cure for like herpes. AIDS, cancer, and other incurable illnesses. Uh, so do you think, even though we said his inventions were kind of half-baked, was he onto anything? Did he actually, was he actually able to regenerate her skin cells or any kind of results, positive results? I, I'm i not a scientist by any means. I mean, I'm basically a high school dropout. <laughs> but <laughs> I, I think what he was onto was what's lacking in science nowadays, which is a sense of playfulness, a sense of putting things together that might not work. The science Mm -hmm. is so dogmatic nowadays. You know, you have to have, you know, uh, double-blind studies. And what does that even really mean? Like, I think where he might have been onto something was curiosity and what what you would expect from a child like I, I have an 11 year old. I don't know if you, have, you guys have kids, but when, what I was most fascinated by was watching him play with things and put things together that didn't, that I knew didn't fit, but might've fit. So making a puzzle, smashing a bit in there and doing this, they might've fit. And occasionally they did. So I, I think of him as a very innocent soul and as somebody who, I think science needs more innocence in its in, in what it is nowadays. It has to be less arrogant and more core science. When science was invented, it had a lot of von Kossels in there. You know, Darwin 
Darwin's um, uh, the, the guy who co-wrote. God, I wish I, could, I sound so stupid right now, but the guy who co-wrote the Origin of Species became a spiritualist. And if you know the spiritualists, they believe that you can communicate with the dead. You know, mm-hmm. and I, and and I hate that I can't remember his name, and I feel like I have to look it up right now. But the co-author of the Origin of Species was not a materialist. He believed that we can communicate and went on to try and scientifically prove that with William James. And, uh, you know, all these great had has been scientists. Yeah, there's definitely something to that the kind of playful experimentation trial by error kind of thing. Uh, but he, he, he lives with this corpse for, was it 10 years? Seven years, yeah. Seven years. And then after that, uh, he gets... He gets caught. Uh, the, the Elena's sister somehow f- hears a rumor that he's sleeping with the corpse, and not necessarily sexually, like you said earlier, but uh, in the house, in the bed, he crashes with it, uh, and then uh, they they arrest him and take him. They try to get him to court, and he gets he gets off on um, a technicality where the the statute of limitations had had run out. But the charges were desecrating a grave, not so much necrophilia. So he was never actually charged with uh, sort of a, a heinous crime. But were you to do that today, you would absolutely be uh, interred in an insane asylum, if not jail, for probably the rest of your life. So he escaped the bullet on that one. So what is his life post that? What where where does he go after he gets all this behind him and they they reinter the corpse in a secret location so he can't go back there and find it again? He he wants. Uh, did you um, did you read the part about the the mausoleum? What what he does after? And this is my favorite part of the story because I'm an I'm an Ed Wood guy, uh, as I brought up several times in the parallels between. But he leaves the courtroom a very bitter person because they wouldn't give him Elena back, and it's all mm-hmm. he wanted. Yeah. So, you know, people come to visit him as curiosity, you know. And he, he talks in his journal about how nice that was and how nice the people of Florida were to him and how nice, uh, it, unexpectedly nice it was to accept him. He never thought he was doing anything wrong. You know, remind yourself. Like, put yourself in that position. Like, he wasn't doing anything wrong. Yeah, so there's he, definitely he, no malice there. But yeah, and I do remember reading that uh, he recreates a false corpse with like a, like the uh, death he, death mask of her and makes he makes a new mannequin to live in his house with him. Right. That that's later though. But like so, if you go back to immediately after the trial, he kind of goes back home a saddened guy and packs up his things and vows to leave uh, Key West forever, and he does. But he stops by the cemetery and stops by the mausoleum. And the only invention that ever worked, that he ever did, he leaves in the mausoleum, and that is a, a um, alarm clock time bomb. And he blows the cemetery up. And they, you can look this up. This is all true. And I, I, hadn't, surviving. <laughs> I did not read that part. That's the, the, so that's what clock time bomb. What yeah. the hell? <laughs> <laughs> he's like cyberpunk or something. <laughs> yeah, well, he's he has totally steampunk. He has the steampunk <laughs> going on or something. <laughs> Absolutely. And here he is, like this total, you know, just perpetual loser. The one thing he actually the one, creates that anyone can substantiate that he did right is he put a time bomb in that mausoleum and blows the thing to shreds. Um, and one of the one of the authors of the book, uh, Ben, has a fragment of the tombstone, which I, I think is kind of fascinating. But I, I just I, I, that was his winning moment. And then he does go back to Zephyr Hills, and oddly, his uh, Dolores, his wife, um, Doris. I'm sorry, Doris. Yeah, she, she takes care of him. Hey, I- we, yep. we got to go on break, Joe. Summoning us. Can you? Is this a good? Uh, can we start up at this point when we come back, Ronnie? Sure, of course. It is right after the place explodes. For some <laughs> reason, 
Uh, Ronnie, your voice reminds me of the dude from Better Call Saul. What's that guy's name? <laughs> <laughs> I'm a New York like boy, man. I don't know, like, I'm an Better Italian. Call Saul. <laughs> uh, for some reason, his name has escaped me right now, but I'm going to look it up in a second. Uh, we'll be right back. You're listening to Church of Mavis Radio Show, United Public Radio, 107.7 FM, New Orleans. And do you have a site, Ronnie, that you want to give out or anything? TheMidnightArchive.com. All right, TheMidnightArchive.com. We'll be back shortly in eight minutes. Uh, Ronnie, just don't hang up. We'll be back in eight minutes. Oh, I'm going to... Hello, you're listening to United Public Radio. I'm Joe Montaldo, host of News on the Flipside. Check us out every Saturday night, 6 to 9 p.m. Central Time. You are invited to the Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show every Friday night on United Public Radio Network from 9 to 10 p.m. Pacific Time, 12 to 1 a.m. Eastern Time with your spiritual warrior goddess, Kathy Bilski. Kathy will share all the old truths the Illuminati tries to keep secret. Kathy also gives you the opportunity to join in with planetary healing light work that will help us manifest World Enlightenment 2016. So let's get high and fly into new possibilities. So join Kathy every Friday night on UPRN, The Quantum Leap Let Light Unite show, a very powerful happening. Hello, this is Angela Thomas with a message about living life to the fullest. As a psychic clairvoyant, I often give insights to one's career path, financial situation, or relationship. Whether one is happy or not in their current situation, where he or she is right now is an important part of learning valuable lessons that can lead to fulfilling one's life purpose. If I can offer you insight, feel free to contact me at 636-278-2272, again 636-278-2272, or visit my website angelathomas.org. I'm considered a psychic psychic, so I provide accurate and detailed psychic readings for individuals as well as groups. Remember, no matter what influences your life at the moment, live life to the fullest. Stay in gratitude, count your blessings, and prepare yourself for more opportunities around the corner. I'm Psychic Angela Thomas, and my website is AngelaThomas.org. The UPRN family of shows would like to take a moment to thank our loyal listeners for tuning in to UPRNTalkRadio.com along with 107.7 FM New Orleans. Broadcasting on multiple platforms like Live 365, Ustream, and Shoutcast has made the UPRN the longest-running, highly-rated, and best source of quality, unique programming that is not afraid of the status quo in alternative media. This station has a solid course of shows and hosts that refuse to get stuck in a rut or be overrun by a groupthink mentality because station owner, host, and iCar founder Joe Montaldo knows the value of letting his talented stable of hosts grow uninhibited. In this genre, that's an accomplishment which many in alternative radio are striving for but are left consistently wanting. This is all made possible because of you, the listener, that tunes in live every night, who can tell the difference that independent thinking makes. The best way to show our appreciation is to thank you and continue to allow our listeners the ability to download the archives of all the shows free of charge on iTunes, Podbean, and SoundCloud. No monthly fees, 
no cost to download individual shows, and none of the constant hassling for donations. That's the UPRNRadio.com difference. So stick around, there's much more to come with new shows on the way. For now, feel free to join your favorite show live in the Pal Talk chat room, easily accessible off UPRNTalkRadio.com, and share the experience of listening live with other listeners from around the world. So thanks for listening, and thank you for being a part of the UPRNTalkRadio.com family of listeners. Hi, come check out Christina George's new show, Alien GFOs and Beyond, Thursday night, 8 p.m. See you Thursday, Jeff. Hi, I'm Joe Montaldo, and you're listening to United Public Radio. You want to learn about aliens, extraterrestrials, UFOs? Visitations, military abductions, join Joe Montaldo on Wednesday night, 8 to 10 p.m. for his episodes of UFO Undercover. This is Michael Angley of Michael Angley Live, Discovery Paranormal, and a daily update with Michael Angley. For the best news and commentary, tune in to Michael Angley Live every Saturday at 6 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Central. For the best paranormal talk in town, Tune in to Discovery Paranormal every Tuesday night, 9 p.m. Eastern, 8 p.m. Central. And check out UPRN, United Public Radio Network, every day for the daily update with Michael Angley. All on United Public Radio Network, UPRNTalkRadio.com, 107.7 New Orleans. Come check out Christina George's new show, Paranormal Connections, only on United Public Radio, Monday, 8 to 10 p.m. See you Monday. Hello, you're listening to United Public Radio. I'm Joe Montaldo, host of News on the Flipside. Check us out every Saturday night, 6 to 9 p.m. Central Time. to UFO Undercover, Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Eastern, with your host, Joe Montaldo, right here on the Paranormal Radio Network.
Mabel. I'm stoked. I'm stoked. I'm ready. <laughs> this is awesome. Welcome back to the Church of Mavis Radio Show. I'm about to strangle my dogs live on air. <laughs> Poor dog. He <laughs> lets them out. We're back with Ronnie Thomas. Y'all hush up. Nobody's here. You bark at nothing. Probably a ghost. Good <laughs> Sometimes my dogs, they just like, I don't know if they're seeing something else that I can't see. Like they just got a, a retarded side or something when it comes to the barking. <laughs> it can drive you crazy. I guess all dogs are like that. Well, not all of them, but a lot of them. So we're at the point. You're, all right, you're listening to United Public Radio 107. Uh, point seven FM New Orleans. We've got Ronnie Thomas here with us tonight. We got Jay. We were just at the point where uh he set the bomb off and then I guess he evaded the authorities in his own weird way, right? One thing I want to talk well, that, about uh was okay, let's pick up where we started. Do you remember? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's just to throw off the bomb and you were gonna lead in with something about Doris that it, 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 is a strange, not divorced wife that lived in the same city or well, nearby. She was in Zephyr Hills, so she was up by the reservoir where you guys get your water from. <laughs> um, and she, she, she doted on him, and as a as a, as a loyal, faithful uh, wife at that time would do, she took care of him. You know, she had she as embarrassing as the ordeal they'd gone through. But we should go back to the explosion because. They didn't pursue him, you know. And why might they not pursue him? Because uh, Ben Harrison, who wrote Undying Love, one of the, one of the two books, said they were happy to be rid of him. I don't think that's true. I I, I think that they um, they all harbor secrets, as all towns do. And Key West is as opulent as it may be now. It's a small town at that time, and. You know, they, they know what it's like to have a dark side, and we all do. And I think that's worth talking about. Um, when you talk about fantasy, there's a light side and there's a dark side. I mean, the dark side of all of our psyches is always there. And if you want to pretend it's not, you're lying to yourself, right? Anyone who's listening to this, to this show it can faithfully acknowledge that there is a dark side to life, and it's probably yeah. the more overwhelming side. Definitely. One thing, uh, Ronnie, just a, a brief summary of me a little bit. My dad died in my early 20s, and it happened right after I had testicular cancer and went through chemo. So I went through that, got healed, and then a year or so later, my dad died. Then I went through a divorce, uh, and then shortly after that, I went kind of nuts and got, I never did drugs, but after that, I did. And I, I got into the occult. I, I didn't really practice it, but I read a lot of stuff had a lot of crazy, weird experiences uh, from seeing beings of light uh, appear to me with friends seeing them with me. Uh, and just two years ago, I saw two beings of light fly out of my house into the heavens from this house. And I believe on some level what I figured out is that they're us without our bodies. We're like glowy aliens. That's what I think anyway. But to the point, I, I, that grief, I, I, that was a shamanic death of some sort for me to go through chemo and testicular cancer. I lost one in the war, so to speak, and then my dad dies. So I went through all that stuff, and next thing you know, I'm looking up Naki and Magic and messing with that Necronomicon book, and we've had Peter Levin on about that book, you know, the silent yeah. paperback, and I was messing around with all kinds of crazy stuff, and I started to have mass UFO sightings with multiple witnesses, and they would follow me to whatever house that I went to, wherever I moved. So it was all this stuff when you're talking about, you know, death and everybody going through it is that's what death is what brought all that stuff on and now i have you know books out about the subject and doing the show and you know it's all connected on some level but it's 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 interesting with this story about you know the death part and just the the madness because i can relate to it but luckily i i didn't go (laughs) i didn't go that deep that far off the deep end but in many ways i i did you know with drugs and stuff and Going to heavy metal concerts, and I mean, I was out. I was I was a wild one after my dad died. I went nuts on some level, 
But I had all that stuff happen to me. It's just interesting what how death can transform you. Well, it's funny how it's funny it's funny how you bring the shamanic term up because as we're learning, that's so much about what it's about. It's about almost tempting death and being part of death and experiencing death while being alive. And you did use that term, and I think that's important because that's how we see, you know, these shamanic rituals. It's it's teasing death and getting as close to it as possible uh, because it's the one thing that we all share. It's the one thing we're all going to ever have in common. Like, we may never meet eye to eye. Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are never going to meet eye to eye on anything, but the one thing they're going to ever share that no one can dispute is that they're both going to die when they were both in. And no matter what, we're brethren in that sense. And I think... And it's funny you bring up UFOs, too, because so much research and so much has been going into what the UFO phenomena actually is and how does it relate to all these other phenomena, Bigfoot, ghosts, uh, quantum multiverses, and stuff like that. I think we jumped to the conclusion that we were so smart. And I think that's why I'm so attracted to Von Kossel's story is because he never, he just kind of went with his own insanity you know whereas everyone else just thinks well we are just so we have everything figured out and the daily show is going to tell us what we need to know you know and it doesn't it answers no questions like you can make fun of something and Penn and Teller and I respect them for what they're doing um, and these you know like guys who debunk everything the amazing Randy who's got his own issues who wants to debunk all the stuff that you can't quite explain away. My theory, I think it's chaos. I think that one day you're living a perfectly normal life. The next day it will all be turned on its head because some force is challenging that. I mean, I may sound like a lunatic, hopefully not to your audience. <laughs> no, you know, you know, you're no in, not at all. <laughs> and quite well. We've we've had many shamans on from all over the world on the show. Mm-hmm. I've had them on from Siberia to freaking America to sure. you name it. I've had at least God more to at least around ten at least. I love that. That's my my go to for sure. Well, I, I love that stuff. It's, it's great. Look, look at look at Rasputin. I mean, I think Rasputin was a Siberian shaman. I mean, I I, I think that I I, I he, he knew he just went with his kind of gut, which is what people like Von Kossel do, I think that and when you do that, it's frightening. And when it's frightening, it's either attractive or detractive. And a Karininin and her court were attracted to it because he seemed to, and by and large did know things that were going on. And the shaman seemed to, and there's no arrogance to it. They just seem to know things that we don't know and challenge our materialist viewpoint. Right? Definitely. <laughs> What was, uh, so Carl was born in Germany and have any That's, religious upbringing or anything like that? No, no, he was, he was, he was Catholic as I am. And okay. I was raised Catholic as well. I think the Catholic religion is where all pagan and uh, occult rituals lie. That was the, where, where the accepted version of the occult. And we are, I mean, like the, 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 the Catholics are the remnants of all the occult ideals. I know a little bit about uh, the Catholicism, uh, the stories of the saints and stuff. I've, I've always enjoyed those. That's about my extent of it. And I'm always <laughs> have these little prayer books with saints and stuff and read them when I'm, I need it. <laughs> and I need my sure. medicine. But I grew up in the <laughs> South Baptist Christianity, and my dad was a fanatic. Uh, he was mentally abusive, mean, and he backslid. And it was weird, but a lot of abuse from Christianity in my family. My mother... Uh, and her sisters were molested by a grandfather who was a preacher. So it's just a lot of a lot of horror when it comes to religion. But uh, but I, it's like I've said on the last show with Greg Kaminsky from A Cult of Personality. I can't seem to ever shake Christianity, even though I try. I run, I run, but it's always nipping at my heels. I can't get rid of it. It's like I'm, I'm sitting here reading books about Norse shamanism now, but I'll still eventually go back to reading Psalms or something yeah. at some point. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but 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 if you like, you I'm sure you know Madame Blavatsky and you know yeah. the, the, the Theosophists. What 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 I think the brilliance of 
Blavatsky and maybe the Nazis perverted what she was trying to do in a lot of ways, you know, but I think what she was trying to do was say that all these religions have a common thread and it isn't just be nice to each other and all those silly little peripheral things. There's a lot of mystical commonalities between all that and we we're so far beyond it nowadays and no oh, technology and science and mathematics and all this stuff has answered so many questions, but it hasn't answered that big question. I think what Blavatsky and the Theosophists were trying to do was trying to answer the big question, which became too hard to answer. So, you, of course, you're going to go back to religion because it's the one access point you have, you know? Definitely. And, well, uh, one thing I'm wondering... How does this story end with him? How does he die? And did it finally come to a flaming, boiling end? If there's anything you'd like to talk about before it happens and then kind of lead up to it, that whatever you're comfortable doing. But, I mean, uh, how does this story end? I, I think the criticism that I'm getting from the producers of the feature film is the ending of the film, which in my eyes is he dies a very, very depressed, lonely life which isn't how you want to see your, the hero of your film. You want to see him go on to do what he always wanted to do, you know, or at least perceive himself to be this kind of enigmatic character that he always thought. But unfortunately, he lives far too long. He should have died, you know, in a romantic sense. He should have died right after he blew up the cemetery. You know, he should have died with the cemetery if he was really committed to this uh, idea of being this hopeless romantic. Uh, but he doesn't, you know. I mean, he dies, uh, what is it, like, um, geez, like 15 years later uh, in, a, in, in a house, you know, just as, you know, reclusive, you know. The airplane, this ridiculous airplane that had been used as like a, a plaything for his next-door neighbor's kids. Uh, rusting on the side, um, and you know it—it's it, kind of anticlimactic, unfortunately. In the in the actual historical narrative, it is. What are you talking about? The airplane? He lived in the airplane? No, no, he—it it was on the lawn of the place that he'd been living in. Uh, this, oh. it, it, I think we've talked about this. Oh, no, it's a toy. Okay, I got you. I got yeah, you. A ridiculous airplane that would never have flown or landed. Uh, that he had half baked as all things in his life. <laughs> when, when he died, didn't he? Didn't he actually have uh, allegedly? Maybe uh, th there's two stories to that ending. There, where one says that he was found three days after he died, hugging the second effigy of Elena that he had made, and another one says that somehow he secreted her body out of the mausoleum and yeah. was uh, was found again dead three days after his death hugging that effigy on the floor. Yeah. That's how all folklore starts. Who knows yeah. what the truth is. But if you can put yourself in the policeman's shoes, in the darkened room that he enters with this reportedly dead old man sleeping next to a, a lifeless wax effigy or, you know, dead body, you know, that had been thrice removed from the grave, can you imagine the look on this guy's face when he has to face this, you know? <laughs> like, he has to see this, like, horrible scene. No matter what, one of those two scenes unfolded, whether it was her actual body or this even more terrifying wax effigy. Uh, would you want to be in... It's like um, a true detective. Do you want to really face that horror? <laughs> I would probably hurl, <laughs> to be honest with you. I, but I don't think it's grotesque. I, I, I think it's more the limits of human, the, the potential of the human mind mm -hmm. in its sanity. Insanity is great because you just lock yourself away and you're, but he, he so rode the borders of sanity because nobody ever saw him as insane, uh, including himself. So he rode those borders so like, we, we can all relate to a sane human being in a dark room slung over with the corpse of a woman who died at that point 
you know, 27 years earlier, it's, it's, it's unfathomable. Like, it, it, you know, can you just picture the visual horror and I'm a visual storyteller. So I have to think of that visually and it's terrifying, you know, at least it for is. me. It's, it's definitely something else. No doubt about it. I'm, I'm kind of curious. Who would you have played this guy in a movie? The, Do you have Mac? Oh, <laughs> I, I we're the people I want to reach out to, and I've asked uh, the producers to. There's a guy named uh, Vinny Cassell. I don't know if you saw Shatan, which is um, it, I didn't know who he was. Apparently, he's like an Academy Award winner at this point, but I hadn't what? seen his yeah. films. The name of the film that I was introduced to him was called Shatan, like Satan, but like the Russian uh, spelling Shatan. Yeah, um, I've heard and, that. Before from Thomas Harris, those Hannibal books and stuff. Sure, so, yeah, yeah. Then the, well, the movie, I have to check that out. Um, yeah, it has no connection to the Harris books. It's more about the folklore of the Shatan, and oh. um, he's just brilliant in the film. I mean, he he owns this character and this diabolical, smiling trickster, you know, that we're so familiar with in this world. You know, the trickster character, the guy who's always smiling but never has anything good to um, to do. I'd almost reverse that with him. The other, the, the Everyone's talking about Johnny Depp. I, I think he's overexposed at this point. I think that he's kind of bored himself to death with his, char- with his character. Gary Oldman, I think, would be great. I'd love to see him play. I call John Malkovich, but he may be too old, but he kind of looks like the old guy, <laughs> the old picture of him. Yeah. Yeah, or 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 um, uh, Chris Chris Walken could do a great job too. Because oh man, yeah, another anyone who you don't quite know what's going on, Johnny Depp. I feel like you get what's going on. He's an actor. Like it's so transparent that Johnny Depp is an actor nowadays. That it, it Edward was the pinnacle for him, to, in my opinion. He did him great. There's no going back. Um, but someone like Walken, who knows what's going on in his mind? And there should be that actorial sense of mystery, right? Like, what? I want to be scared, but I also want to be attracted at the same time. You I know? love that uh, John Malkovich, that Mary Riley movie. That's one of my favorites. That uh, Jekyll and Hyde movie. That's a good one. Excellent. Excellent. And Jekyll and Hyde is, to me, one of the best. There is no greater story, as you might like Frankenstein. To me, Jekyll and Hyde as a New Yorker who sees the best and the worst of people at the same time. I grew up in the city and it's, it's all about the balance of black and white and good and evil. And I see it every day and very good exists and very bad exists. And uh, maybe that's what attracted me so heavily to, to this story because it rides that border of what is good and what is bad what is acceptable and what is taboo. Like, let's play with this for a little while and see where we land because it's a pretty scary outcome because you don't know where you, and in this story specifically in Valcastle, the public wound up on the place that you never would have imagined they'd be. In our day and age, cannibalism and necrophilia are the two things that are, and maybe incest and pedophilia are the the things that are so taboo. But I'd put, you know, pedophilia at the height of that. That's a horrible thing to do. I'm not saying necrophilia is acceptable. I'm just saying it's a complicated thing in this specific situation. But you put that out there for people, man, and they are freaked out by it, which is why I think I've had such a hard time trying to get this film made because... All that people have to hear is, oh, he slept in the corpse for seven years. Enough said, I don't want anything to do with it. Even people I think of as enlightened and inquisitive, they don't want anything to do with it because it's so far on the taboo end of the spectrum. You know, it's sex and death. And those are two things that are both very taboo. I'm trying to find that Shaytan movie, and I, all I can find is like some weird Indian movie or something. Is it like a foreign kind of film or something? It's it's foreign, but it's it's a, it's English language. Um, it looks it, Bollywood. 
Is it call? Is it okay? Is it five substance abusing friends decide to fake a kidnapping? Is that it? Mm, yeah, that's the one, and that's okay. with Vinny Casal. And if you look at Vinny Casal in that film, he he is he he becomes the Shia Ten, and he really owned. Nobody would put that much effort into owning that kind of again shamanistic borderline character of. Is he good? Is he bad? Is he laughing? Is he scary? I love those balances. From India, that's right. That's it. India. Is it? Yeah, I guess so. I, I didn't. I didn't. I didn't put. I it just want to check it out later, so I wanted to make sure I'd have an OCD attack about it and forget, and have to ask you later an email. <laughs> <laughs> no, please do, man, and stay in touch, man. I mean, you guys. Yeah, it, yeah. Apparently, uh, Kim Chemperin, right? Yeah, that's that is the. Uh, <laughs> That's the film, and I and I do hope you'll watch it because I don't think many people manage to uh, suffer through it. But I think you have to see beyond what um, what what the director's trying to tell you, and look what the writer's trying to tell you, which is so often what you have to do. Which is why I'm so insistent on directing this film rather than just being the writer on the film. I, I need to show you what I'm trying to say because it's so much more powerful. Man, I keep thinking of little Florida people back in the 1930s celebrating this weird necrophilia story. <laughs> I give I, I give them a lot of credit, and I and I and I don't know that they were right to, because I think there's a lot of I think there's a lot of lies to if if I have to strip away the layers, I think von Kassel was a liar. I think he was the quintessential pathological liar, but I think he believed his lies. So that kind of makes things a little better because it, there was, like you say, there was no malice in it. And as Jay was trying to say, I think, earlier, it's, if, if, if you don't know that you're doing any wrong, are you really doing any wrong? You know, he didn't hurt anybody. He's not Ed Gain. He's not Norman Bates. He didn't actually physically hurt anyone. Mentally, I think, the family of the corpse, he certainly hurt. But they had their corruptions too, you know. Everyone's exposed for who they are, you know. In this story, at least the way I tell it, <laughs> we're all done. Yeah, I, yeah. I think absolutely. The only, the only harm he did was a little emotional to the family of Elena, um, and but they're the both sides. His his story and her story and her family story it's all tragic almost everyone in her family died of either diphtheria or tuberculosis yeah, yeah. It's, it's the story doesn't have a positive ending no matter how you want to try to spin it and the producers in hollywood will try to make you spin a positive result towards the end even though the actual end is absolutely anticlimactic oh it's grim but i'll i'll only argue that in the sense that he did in the end, get what he wanted. If the story of him laying down and dying next to, uh, 15 years later, next to the, even just the kind of fictionalized corpse of what had once been, he still won. He still remained pure to what he had been obsessed with. Mm -hmm. You know, I'm a, I'm a guitar player. And I, I, when I was starting to play guitar, I obsessively played guitar. I couldn't stop. And to this day, I have to make sure that I do it right. And I want to die with a guitar in my hands. You know, I love my wife. I love my child. But I want to die with a guitar in my hands. You know, I always said I want to die on the beaches of Mexico or Spain playing Spanish guitar. Um, and I hope that that happens. And I don't know that that will because I might not be as true to my ultimate end as he was. He made that happened could you really could either of you dedicate your lives to a to something that had once been and is no is not any longer not for me i'm 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 like jeff i'm a little ocd on on certain things but I, i'm also easily distracted by bright shiny objects so <laughs> i might try a project and get halfway done and then years later come back to it after having done 15, 20 other projects in the interim. So, yeah, no, I I would not dedicate something to that. <laughs> well, I, I, I think our, our lifetime has purged away 
devotion. Devotion is dead. We, there is no more devotion. And maybe there's devotion to your work or diver, devotion to a philosophy or a political party. That's all nonsense. This guy devoted his life to something that had once been physically that he believed would continue to be spiritually. That's pretty powerful in my eyes, you know, and I, I don't know. I mean, maybe I'm crazy and God knows I've been called that. <laughs> I, I don't think you're crazy, but I, I think I could absolutely de- devote myself, dedicate myself to a person or, or to a, a couple of people, whether it's a child of mine or a stepchild uh, and, you know, a good woman. That is something that if I could get that, boom, you know, that I would die happy, but I, my, I think my fate is more, you know, dying as an old man alone, no family, nothing to speak of, no, you know, major historical, you know, accomplishments, whether they're famous accomplishments or just an accomplishment that I want to do. Like, I, I'd like to make a movie. That's one of my dreams that I'd like to make a Hollywood blockbuster, but I don't see it happening as much as I even try to dedicate myself to that. I don't see it happening. Uh, see, I, I don't agree. I, I think it, it, you can do anything. It, it, maybe this is my Von Kostel coming out of me. I think that it's it's what it's how you perceive it. I mean, you don't want to make Transformers Seven, obviously. You want to tell your own story, and I think he wanted to tell his own story, and I think he did, and he was content with it. And now I want to tell his story the way I see it, because it reflects a lot of my own story and certainly not the gruesome aspects of it, but this challenge of, you know, what is reality and what is fantasy and at what point does that line blur? So I don't know that you're right in saying that you're, you're, you're never going to do those. I, I think everyone will, if they're obsessed and they're, then they challenge it, everyone will do those things that they set out to do. It may not be the way that you wanted it to be or your parents wanted it to be for you, but, you will do it because there's no other point to be on this earth, you know. Hey, uh, just got to do the plug real quick. You're listening to United Public Radio, 107.7 FM, New Orleans. And, yeah, I mean, my situation with me for 10 years, I thought uh, I talked about writing books. And then I started doing these written interviews on Examiner where I would write out questions for people and they would answer them, different authors, about anything from horror to paranormal to you know, even the lady that wrote the True Blood uh, book from you sure. know, the HBO show. Uh, right now, her name escapes me. Char- Char- Charlene I, Harris. Charlene Harris. I did her book. Her, <laughs> I've interviewed her in written form. But then suddenly, uh, I had all these written interviews, and Andrew Colvin, a buddy of mine that's known as the Mothman photographer, put them all in books. And next thing you know, I have 13 books on my Amazon page. <laughs> you know, it's like I didn't even know I was writing a book when I was writing a book. <laughs> sure. After talking and, about and, it. And, you, and, and you, can't, you can't dispute that. I mean, you've done something. You've left something behind. Nobody can ever take that away. You know, the, the, the ruins of Rome, it's not going to fall again. That will always exist. I think there's power to where we are nowadays, right? Definitely. I mean, as, as opposed to where Von Kossel was, where he can only make this very small statement. I want to carry the torch for him. I want to, I want to take it further than he did. And not, I think I'm, as you can tell, maybe approaching it very philosophically, very, it's almost like a Kafka thing for me. And maybe I'm intellectualizing what... For some reason, what, why my dark mind seeing you in your room and you stare over and there's your corpse with a mask on. <laughs> I'll have to, I can show you my room right now. I have a lot of wax. I'm wax playing heads. with you. <laughs> oh, no, I I do. I mean, I live with, you know, wax wax heads, and I, I oh. one of the things I do is collect. Well, not 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 death masks or anything like that, but I, I collect. Never. <laughs> I, I collect taxidermy, and I collect um, things that most people would consider strange and unusual, and most of my career creatively has been collecting and documenting the strange and unusual. That's how I got into this, you know. But we're all strange and unusual, man. If you look at anyone out on the street, I'm not, I was just thinking, 
making Norman Bates jokes with you for a second there. But me, man, I got Sasquatches <laughs> all over my house, aliens. Sure. I got Native American tapestries with coyote on it. I got it's crazy <laughs> in here too. Don't worry. <laughs> well, because we're, but we're all we're all looking for answers, right? I mean, and and yeah. are we are we ever going to find in our lifetimes? Look, if we ever did, I'm a Futurama fan. And there's a great episode uh, where Dr. Farns, uh, Farnsworth finds the meaning of life, and he's all disappointed because he realized that the questions is what kept him going. And there's so much truth to that. Like, I don't want to know the answers. Like, wh- that's where we end. We, we, we'll never, like, I'd rather never, I'd wanna, I want questions to be better than answers, right? Who knows what Don Caso was thinking? Who knows what's true? I love half truths and and conjecture and folklore because I think that's why you have aliens and Bigfoot. It's folklore, but maybe it's not folklore. I mean, there's evidence to suggest both, right? <laughs> what do you think about the spirit? Do you think it was really a spirit of her that was appearing, or maybe you know uh, you could take the superstitious? Was it a demon trying to make them do crazy stuff? I mean, like a trickster. Journal- yeah. yeah, like a trickster or something. I, you know, I don't see what the value would have been for a trickster, but maybe the value was to just throw things in the air and make things crazy and get a guy in the 21st century trying to make a film about and, and convey this story. You know, who knows? I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know where I lie. I spent the first you know, the, the first decade of my life, uh, maybe two decades, Catholic, you know, like understanding that there was forces working against us and towards us because we, and the Catholics have, you know, the devil, who is an obsession of mine, a very strong obsession. I have him tattooed twice on my body. Um, and not to say that I'm a Satanist because I don't believe that either, but I always believed in forces other than the law, you know, there were greater things affecting our lives. And who knows? Who knows what it could have been, you know? I mean, we, we, we're, we're so smart nowadays, and things still happen. UFOs still come down. Bigfoot still gets sighted. Houses still get haunted. And these are from people who have nothing to gain from saying this is happening. But we're all so smart nowadays, right? And we're on the verge of nuclear holocaust. <laughs> <laughs> Let's hope. That's the best outcome. Let's wipe it all out and it'd be great, but I don't think that'll happen. I think that, I don't know. What do you guys think? I mean, I'm, I, 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 know, I know your viewpoint to some extent. But One thing I brought up today on my Facebook is I was like, you know, reading all this stuff about Russia, you know, online, you know, Putin's calling back everybody to the motherland, uh, Mikhail Gorbachev saying that, you know, all hell's about to break loose and all this stuff. And then I go, well, I'm going to turn on the news and, you know, see what's going on. I couldn't find them talking about this anywhere. It's like just Trump, Hillary, Trump, Hillary, Trump, Hillary, Trump, Hillary. It's like I'm trying to find out about the Russian nuclear holocaust here. It's all over the news online. The New York Post, I mean, big places are talking about New York Post, uh, you know, everybody from all the online outlets, but on regular, you know, cable TV. I can't find crap about it. Well, it's either that. Well, it's either that people want to subdue it as like Roswell, you know, like nobody really wants to talk about what happened in Roswell because maybe it was a government secret and maybe it was something else. So I, I think we're, we're I, I don't buy, I'm not an Alex Jones guy. I think he's an idiot. Nope. You know, he's a fear monger. I don't even like George Nori. I mean, I think he's a fear monger as well. But <laughs> uh, coast to coast, George Nori. I mean, I, I, I don't. <laughs> no, exactly. I mean, give me back Art Bell any day. I think Art Bell had a spirit, and he was a great, a great communicator of uh, what we're talking about. But I think that conspiracies are are, are just so rampant nowadays, and I, we'll never know the truth. I don't. I don't think that we're meant to know it, right? But I think we can we can search for it, and we can certainly search for answers. I think in our lifetime we'll see certain truths. I think we'll see what's going on in the rest of the universe. Uh, maybe they'll present themselves to us, you know. Am I crazy now? <laughs> oh, no, no. 
Dude, I, like I said, one of my big eye openers when, is when I've seen, uh, after my dad died, of being a person made out of light on the cloud top, so, appearing and doing his finger like naughty naughty at me, and a friend saw it right next to me. And then a couple mm-hmm. of years from here, like I said, two beings of light flying out of my roof into the heavens. So, I mean, I'm at the point now that I've always had a problem with death and fear of it and just obsessed about it. But seeing that, it's like I, even seeing that, I believe that's what we are. Like we're, somehow we're energy beings, and that's what we are in these bodies, and then apparently even more so when we're out of them. But I've seen that, and I still can't get over death. You know, it's like I even know that we're going to carry on, and possibly that you know that was the form that we're going to take, and uh, or that we are, or when we die, we get released and become that. But. Uh, I still have a problem with death. I just can't get over it. It's like the white elephant in the room every second. <laughs> well, it, it's so. It, it, if we have to tie this all back to Von Kossel, his relationship with death was like this fascination and almost this obsession, and he saw death as life. And I think what he was getting at was consciousness, and which is kind of all the rage right now with the whole ayahuasca thing and everyone trying to access their consciousness using some kind of technology. Um, but I, I'm of the belief, and I think if Von Kossel was alive today, he would be of the belief that consciousness is an external force. It's coming to us. Like it, our brain and our cells are just receptors, and they're receiving something that we can't we can't explain, and they're, it's coming to us. Um, and I think in his journals, I can't I, unfortunately I, I'm, I can't cite it, but he does hint at it that it, it, it being in in something else that's controlled. You know the Damon and the Italon. Uh, I don't know if you know this that concept of where the yeah. Italon, but then the the Damon, the Damon who's kind of controlling us um, uh, on kind of the back end. I think he he hints at that in his journal, and I'm glad that I'm bringing that up because I'd like to incorporate that into my script uh, even further. But I, I I think that it's it's just weird that this you know quasi mad scientist would come up with that concept 50 years ago, 60 years ago. Where did you get his journals from? Is that available in another book or where? No, did you it's, get... it's freely available. I mean, I on the Kickstarter I put the I put the PDF as kind of a thing, but it's, just look up, uh, the, he, he had published it uh, in a pulp magazine, like a, it, called Fantastic Adventures. Wow, it's like weird tales and stuff. It, yeah, like the old weird tales, and it's the only one who would publish it, and he was so, the only thing that turns me off about him is that he was so desperate to have his memoirs published, which indicates that he was looking for some kind of fame. But, yeah. I and uh, I always shy away from people who are looking for like that's not I, I'm not interested in that I don't I, I've been offered roles on television shows and whatever and there's nothing there for me I don't I don't care you know like I don't need to be famous I, I don't need to I'd like my the ideas that we're talking about to be more prolific but I don't care about myself being the icon of that you know I think what you're doing is great on this show I think being open to these ideas is is endlessly important to be able to discuss these these things without being laughed at and without being ridiculed and scorned. What you're doing is, you know, in my eyes, God's work. I mean, that that's powerful. You know, right. you could be on. Yeah, well, you're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> I'm great. I'm I'm very happy to have you part of the lineup. Last year we had a uh, Victor Foya. Uh, he writes books about Vlad the Impaler. It's kind of like the true story of Vlad the Impaler, but fiction. Uh, and he was on telling uh, Vlad the Impaler stories, and he's from Transylvania, so the voice and everything. So that was excellent. But this year is excellent, too, because we got you and Nick Redfern and then the the guys that are going to be talking about that magazine that's like Weird Tales the last Friday. But sure. we got Frankenstein this year, so it's like great. I love it. Well, Redfern just just wrote that great book on the Loch Ness monster. Uh, We're and, talking about that too, yeah. Oh, it's been, have you read it? It's fantastic. I, I've I mean, read some of it. Yeah, he's coming on about monsters. Another one, uh, one of his other books, and that uh, the monster book, creatures, beasts, and fiends of nature, and then Anne Nessie. Yeah. So we're going to be talking a little bit about both of those. 
It's you know what I, I think there's a renaissance to all this stuff. I, I'm obsessed with. Remember, in search of, and as a filmmaker doing my series, I'm obsessed with revisiting in search of, and like they still haven't gone away. You know, none of these things. Bigfoot's still around. UFOs are still around. The Greys are still around. Loch Ness monster still around. They're not going away. Uh, and I hope they never do, man. And I hope that you keep them going. <laughs> Yeah. It's great. Just, Brack actually brought that up. The monsters. Uh, I don't know if you guys saw this video. Uh, they they believe they captured a megalodon, the largest shark ever, uh, in the Marianas Trench some time ago on a video that was monitoring a trap to see what kind of animals would come to the food in the trap. And this huge shark. I mean, it's enormous. At least fifty feet long. Have you seen that? No. Oh Where's my that? God. Oh, it, I came on Facebook a couple of weeks, like last week or the week before, and it's uh, it's scary. If this if it's not a fake video and it doesn't really look fake, uh, megalodon it has now been proven as fact. Even though we've had the teeth for years, we now have a living example. Well, Ronald Reagan once said, "Facts are silly things," and it's the one thing he ever said that made any sense in his entire presidential campaign. So you do have to, you know, like, you got to always go, I always go back to facts are silly things. <laughs> hey, hey, man, before we, we're about to end very shortly, but just briefly, what can you tell us about this, your film, Walter Potter, The Man Who Married Kittens, just like a, a little summary. What What is that? Uh, well, I... <laughs> <laughs> the film did extraordinarily well. I mean, we premiered at the Tribeca Film Festival and around the world. It's about a Victorian taxidermist who decided to create anthropomorphized uh, tableau of his taxidermy, which means if you ever saw the movie Dinner for Schmucks, um, that was kind of based on his, with Steve Carell, that was based on Walter Potter's tableau. He put animals in human situations, and the most famous was called uh, The Kitten's Wedding, and it's just a beautiful work of art. It's at the museum that I have my residency up here at called Morbid Anatomy Museum here in Brooklyn, and if anyone's up here, please take a look. It's, it's beautiful, and it's got 18 kittens um, all at a wedding, you know, taxidermy dead kittens. Ce- well, celebrating a wedding. The movie yeah. called Dinner for Who? The movie was called Dinner for Schmucks with Steve Dinner Carell. Well, but that, that's... Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, you know, it, it was... It's actually good. It's not a bad movie, but they took what Potter had been doing and they kind of popularized it. But, you know, you're talking about the 1800s and here's this guy, very much like Potter, this innocent... Country guy, country taxidermist, just making, putting these animals in uh, poses and costumes and dressing them up like dolls, you know, uh, and making them look human. I mean, it's it's a long line of things I've been documenting for years. I mean, like for seven years, it's what uh, I have pet mummific- mummifiers and occultists, and you know, I'm just looking for answers, you know. Whether it's in taxidermy sculptures or, uh, you know, pet mummifiers, I'll, I'll hope, <laughs> I hope to find it someday, right? I mean, we're all Fox Mulder in some way. We got to end, end this uh, kitten now, this puppy. Oh, well, I'm sorry taxidermy. about that. Puppy. <laughs> <laughs> but it's we've different. enjoyed it. It's been a wonderful to behold Dark Halloween show. Love this. <laughs> I love it too, man. You guys are amazing, and what you're doing is definitely fantastic. Give out your website one more time for everybody. Uh, look at themidnightarchive.com. All right, Ronnie. We appreciate it. Thanks, man. And keep us on the loop. If anything I can do for the movie in the future, you just let me know, man. Thank you guys so much. You're amazing. All right. Yeah, take thanks, care. Ronnie. Take care, guys. Thanks, Jay. Thanks, everybody, for listening. You're listening to United Public Radio 107.7 FM, New Orleans. Coming up next, Supernatural Substation. And watch out for dudes that marry kittens. Good night, everybody. (laughs) Bye-bye. Good night.